Welcome back to the Compass Podcast. Today on the show, we're talking all things mining containers with Jesse Davern of RK Mission Critical. Mission Critical is one of the premier container builders within the space. We talk about the engineering behind these containers, how RK Mission Critical came to be, and what a typical deployment looks like. Before we get to the show, quick shout out to our new sponsor, Foundry Digital. The future of digital asset mining calls for top technical talent. As a premier training and education program for professional mining technicians, Foundry Academy answers. From hands-on ASIC labs taught by industry veteran instructors to coursework covering Bitcoin's global impact, Foundry Academy graduates acquire the skills facilities need to be off and mining. They've even built OSHA 10 certification into the curriculum. Open to all who hold a high school degree or equivalent, the next one-week course taking place in Rochester, New York, runs up September 12th through the 17th. Visit foundryacademy.com to register or reach out to academy at foundrydigital.com. Jesse, welcome to the Compass Podcast. I'm, I'm bummed we're both in Denver, like right across the city from each other, but we're not able to do it in person today for the recording. Maybe next time, but Again, thanks for joining us on the podcast. Yeah, yeah, appreciate you having me. Um, yeah, I look forward to do it in person uh, for the next one. Oh yeah, we'll we'll definitely do it. I'm currently slowly working on the media studio for Compass here in Denver. It's right across from the ballpark. It's gonna be really nice. We have like a lot of the podcasting equipment and all that, but it's in the wrong location, not set up yet. So we'll get to it at some point. But at the same time, we wanted to make sure we have this podcast recorded because to my knowledge, there's actually not very much media about containerized solutions for Bitcoin mining. And Bitcoin mining is already a small topic. And then within that, like container solutions is just even smaller. But it's very important. If you're talking to any operator out there, any large Bitcoin mining firm, even like the smaller guys, they're all looking towards containerized solutions. And there's a disparity between the quality of these solutions and the ability to get them given supply chain problems over the last two years. And RK, uh, just as a Compass provider, like we work with you guys on a lot of our solutions and for hosting. Uh, but then also you guys in general are some of the best out there, if not the best. So it's great to get your guys' expertise on the podcast. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate the tire pump there too. Yeah, for sure. That's what we do in the podcast, right? We show a little bit. Um, we'll start off though talking about RK itself. My understanding is you guys have a larger parent company and then Mission Critical is the uh, firm working on these container solutions. But you guys don't only just do Bitcoin mining. You guys operate in basically the larger industry of containerized solutions for any product, whether you're trying to grow marijuana or maybe you want to have like some sort of uh, refrigeration solution behind your grocery store or something like that. There's tons of different ways you can use these containers for making movable real estate. Bitcoin mining is just one of those. So I'll leave it to you. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I'm Jesse Davern with, with RK Mission Critical. Um, so Mission Critical, we are we're a modular manufacturer uh, and you hit on it exactly well. We manufacture a ton of products across uh, a variety of different market verticals. Uh, we we started this business in 2015 with the idea of doing modular data centers for traditional IT settings. Okay, so hyperscale data centers, enterprise, colo, and that's largely what the business was in the beginning. Okay, so still a, still a complete modular form factor. It's just more traditional IT racks, high redundancy, uh, precision mechanical cooling high reliability, okay, sophisticated controls. The progression of the business was really identifying high growth markets and finding an opportunity to create a product to support a high growth market versus a lot of our competitors at the time were just trying to chase individual projects as someone might might add. So we kind of shifted our mindset of saying, all right, we don't necessarily want to chase projects. We want to design a product that can support hundreds of different projects. Okay, so big Bitcoin mining, for example, and we'll, we'll dive into that in a second. And kind of a unique characteristic about our business is we're, we're really engineering focused. Okay, so we, we don't, we're a, a very good blend of construction, manufacturing, and engineering, which 
there's not a ton of businesses right now that have those three pillars underneath them at scale. So, you know, some people are very good at construction or manufacturing, but they don't bring this engineering leg into the, to the equation. So really the, the reason we got into the, the cryptocurrency mining space is we, we saw an opportunity in an industry that at the time, you know, was not very mature at all in 2018. And we didn't feel like there was a true engineered solution for a containerized um, mining unit on the market. Sure, there's other, there's other people building them very small scale. We saw some very scary containers in the, in the beginning in 2018, right? We're, we're packing two megawatts of electrical distribution into a metal box. So we took the, we took the mindset of engineering first to develop a product versus the market trend of just building kind of ad hoc on the spot without a true engineering plan. So the, the other thing that is in supply chains, a huge component I'm sure we'll talk about, but you know, we feel somewhat isolated from a lot of supply chain constraints just based off our parent company, RK Industries. So that, you know, it's a, it's a large holding company that owns seven very diverse businesses. So we're able to work with our sister partners uh, across structural steel, electrical, service, mechanical, and to really bring all these different business units underneath one umbrella with our commission critical so we can truly provide turnkey plug and play solutions. That makes more sense now. Just going to your warehouse a year ago and then hearing about it from other Compass uh, employees who've been to the facility, you guys are just cranking these things out really quickly. And I've just heard so many different people and I've been to a few few uh, other facilities for building these things and it's slow right now because it's hard to get any parts, uh, let alone like these big shipping containers. What are some other containerized solutions you guys build or what are some examples of some of the other container solutions that you most often roll out on your production line uh, compared to like your Bitcoin mining ones? Yeah, so we have we have a, a an established product line for agricultural farming, right? That sounds very different than Bitcoin mining. <laughs> uh, but it's we, all farming. We, oh, yeah, <laughs> we, we work with a great company called Farmbox. Um, and it's it's basically, we have two separate products for them. One is a vertical hydroponic farm. So we, we manufacture this in a 40 foot container and we send these all around the country, Jamaica, Tahiti, Canada. And it's designed to grow any type of leafy green, right? So lettuce, kale, basil, um, they're, even, they're even playing around with trees, like a small kind of tree seedlings. And we have another product for them called the Gourmet Mushroom Farm, which is, you know, literally to, to farm from uh, starting with just raw substrate into growing gourmet mushrooms, whether it's lion's mane, chaga, reishi, kind of exotic mushrooms that can be hard to find in a, in a lot of locations. So it, it's funny, right? Very different industry, but one kind of common theme between all the products that we manufacture is, is intense mechanical, electrical, and control systems. And for us being a manufacturer, right, we, we kind of look at opportunities and products through a different lens. Uh, we, we bring a ton of value to our clients on how to, how to help them scale their business. Okay, so we have very high throughput through our 280,000 square feet of manufacturing facility. Uh, you know, just on, on the mining side alone, you know, we're doing upwards of 70 containers a month and you know each one's two megawatts when you can think about that from a megawatt standpoint it's it's very high volume so we've got the farming units uh, cbd extraction uh, which i think you you may have seen some of those units when you walked the fir- uh, through the first uh, tour which same thing right very intense mechanical ventilation life safety uh, systems go into cbd extraction plants and then we still have a very large footprint in the traditional data center market. So still building modular data centers with UPS, battery backup, um, high reliability, and 
and very sophisticated uh, mechanical electrical distribution. So like I said, ac across a ton of different market verticals, but all very common things and, and all very scalable products. Totally, totally. Let's dive into the, the Bitcoin mining boxes themselves. So correct me if I'm wrong, but two megawatts is typically the size that you guys make for all your modular container solutions for Bitcoin mining. It's a mouthful. Uh, and then you guys can fit between four and 500 A6 in there. We're talking like S19s or what's miners probably depends on what sort of uh, order the, the miner comes up with. What are some other data points we can have about these containers? And I'd be also curious to know if you have any specs on any rival firms, container solutions, or like maybe like the, the generic Acme version of uh, what's out there, how it compares to what you guys build. Yeah, yeah, great question. So our core product, uh, the Disruptor 2000, it's a, it's a two megawatt container. Uh, and we can fit 560 miners in there. We've, we've made the design so that if you're running S19s or micro BT units, it doesn't really matter. We, we have to know ahead of time just so we can make sure we dial in our hot aisle containment. But 560 machines, uh, new age miners fit in each box, which is a substantial amount going into a 40 foot container. But we, we see a lot of our large volume customers really like that density from a standpoint that when they're building out a, a 50 to 100 megawatt site, we're cutting in half the amount of pads they have to pour, um, the amount of feeders they're running from their transformers, right? So getting into this dense footprint with less containers is, is creating an environment where it's easier for them to deploy on site at scale. So we, we've, we've really honed in our design since we started building these in 2018, right? And, and I think if you know you talk to a lot of our customers, we're really known for working with the operators on site to make continuously making enhancements to our core product based off of the operator's input. Right? There's only so many things we can do on the engineering side, but at the end of the day, we we want to talk to the people inside these containers running these on a day to day basis. Right? That the smallest thing may save them, you know, fifty percent of their time when they're loading. 560 miners into each each uh, container. So, I think I think a big thing on the market right now is when you when you look at these mining containers, there's there's still a lot of product coming over from China, um, and these these containers don't have enough ventilation through them. Is really what we're seeing, right? We're 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 still getting a lot of customers who come back to us after they may have purchased units um, from another firm with the issue of airflow and, and temperatures inside their container. We go out to site, which we, we, we try to help them maybe figure out in the short term, how we can retrofit some of their containers to, to keep their uptime a little bit higher. But we really invested heavily in the beginning of the development of this product, doing CFD analysis. Okay, so modeling temperatures, air, uh, air flows, air turbulence through these containers. In the smallest little degree um, of pitch in like a, the rack design, very dramatically affects the airflow in these containers, right? So we've, we went through a very um, extensive process of CFD modeling. And then over the past three years, right, we've been able to compare these CFD models to real world data from our customers. Okay, because the, you know, a CFD is very good, but it's not going to give you so it's not bulletproof, right? So it's a, it's a very fine mixture of, of engineering and real world data. So to give you an example, right? There's there's a handful of containers out there that maybe don't use any supplement supplemental uh, exhaust systems. There's some companies out there using you know maybe one and a half horsepower fans, which in certain climates that I'm not saying it's a bad design. In certain climates that does work, right? But now that we're seeing these places in the U.S. become kind of the the hot you know the hot spot for miners to go to, right? West Texas, Oklahoma. We're seeing that a lot of these other solutions out there are, are just very undersized for the performance that they're needing to to ride through these summer months. 
So we've, you know, for example, we use five horsepower fans um, manufactured in the U.S., direct drive, very high failure rate for the, the companies out there using belt drive fans. And it's just a, a, a maintenance nightmare for them on site after time. So we've, we've tried to look at the holistic approach of, you know, once we send these containers to site, we don't want our customers calling us in six months saying that something's already failed on them, right? We're, we're bringing um, maturity and true technical experience into the space with our data center background of thinking about uptime and reliability. Yeah, just to jump in there a little bit, the, the one thing that was striking to me when I went to your plant, your manufacturing site, was just the the engineering behind everything. And for most people who are jumping into Bitcoin mining, they're thinking about Bitcoin mining in a very similar way that they think about minting an NFT or going on Coinbase and buying Bitcoin. They think that it just exists, right? I can mine Bitcoin. I need a computer. Maybe just need to find a, a weird way to plug it in. That's about it. But the reality of it is it's, it's an industry. It has industrial scales to it and you need actual parts, labor, and uh, efficiencies, including like this engineering structure to be able to mine Bitcoin um, profitably and well through both a bull market and, and a bear market. So it's really cool to see in person your guys' engineering team and the designs that you guys put into these things. I'd be curious to know, just a lot of question back to you. You started in 2015, but here we are in 2022 and you guys have these engineering specs that you've built up over that time. It doesn't seem like a lot of time, right? Seven years. But you guys have been doing that with a few different industries, whether it be data centers, hydroponics, other random uh, containerized solutions, and, and now Bitcoin mining. What are some foundational principles you guys draw on to, to enable you guys to move to market so quickly with these designs? Yeah, our, our process is pretty unique uh, for how we bring a product to market. Okay, so there's, there's always talk in the beginning that someone, someone wants a hundred of something. And, I love selling a hundred of anything, but we always start and say, all right, time out. Let's, let's start with one, right? So really our process is from the engineering side of understanding an issue that a client has. And then we go into building what we call a first of a kind, right? We, we call it a folk. We have a, we have a extensive engineering team who can, who can turn around concepts very quickly to get to our production floor from a product development standpoint. So we, we go through and we build this first of a kind unit, okay? And we only build one. And it's not really even in a manufacturing line at that point. It, it could just be kind of built in a separate area within our, our facility. Okay, so we, we build that first unit. We deploy it. We test it with, uh, with an individual customer. And then what we do is called a Kaizen event. Okay, so it's a Lean Six Sigma uh, philosophy where we gather our engineering team, the customer, the, the customer's operators, and then we trip, typically try to bring in a third party uh, consultant unrelated to the project. And we spend two days going through this entire, the entire process from start to finish, the design, the engineering, um, deployment, functionality on site, all, all these different kind of um, bullet points that we, we hit in this Kaizen. And the idea is that you break every single thing down to these kind of bite-sized chunks. Um, and the whole idea is to get, to gain efficiency, right? We want to get the price out of it. We want to get the lead time out, out of it while keeping the quality up. So after we finish this, this first of a kind, there's always a, a long laundry list of things coming out of our Kaizen event for enhancements we want to make into a product. So then we build our second of a kind and it's a similar process as the first of a kind, right? We build one additional one with all these new enhancements from the first of a kind, deploy it. All right. Maybe there's a few minor tweaks from there and then we're off to the races in production. But a big thing that a lot of these that's needed in the market to support these, these large scale miners that a lot of the, the smaller kind of mid tier manufacturers don't understand. Maybe they understand they have a hard time executing on is the supply chain process. So it, as much as we are a manufacturer, sometimes I feel like we're a logistics supply chain company. 
when you think about how many individual components go into each one of these containers and, and building at scale where it introduces new, new challenges, right? It's easy to go buy one of everything, but when you turn around and have to go put 500,000 20 amp breakers on order, it can be very hard to source, right? So you, you have to have very sophisticated supply chain processes to execute at scale. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of people, a lot of capital, a lot of timing, a lot of patience, probably. Yep. It seems like that whole process from proof of concept all the way to deployment is probably years. Uh, I'd be curious for Bitcoin mining, when was the first time you guys got a request to build a proof of concept and how long did it take you guys to get to your uh, your current model? Yeah, so the the first uh, the first, first inquiry we had was uh, December of 2018. Um, at the time I didn't know what Bitcoin was. I've got coming with my data center hat on saying, how are you fitting two megawatts in a, in a box like that? Um, <laughs> so it, it was, it was a new territory for us for sure. Uh, totally. It took us 12 weeks to design and build that first unit. That unit looks very different than what it does today. So it's been an evolution since then. Um, but the initial product development time took us 12 weeks to develop and and build the first unit. Sort of riffing on the same topic, but turning a little bit towards the engineering of the, the box itself and the parts you guys use. The two megawatts inside a container like that, and that's pretty, that's ridiculous, right? Like you should come to the table and be like, how are you stuffing two megawatts of power into this little box? Uh, I'd be curious if you have any like comparisons on hand for how much energy that is just for for listeners. And then I'd also like to, know a little bit more about the other parts that go inside uh, the box itself. You mentioned the type of fan you guys use. Uh, I'd be curious to know about like the PSUs and different things that go inside the box to make this uh, operational. Like, Do you guys only source from US companies because you find the, the quality to be better or you guys source outside because it's it's cheaper and more efficient? Curious to get all those details. Yeah. Yeah. So when, I, when I'm giving tours of our units, um, when I'm trying to relate two megas of power to someone, I typically walk them through the unit and we've got, we have 14 400 amp distribution panels inside of our, our unit that are, you know, during normal operation are fully taxed. Your house probably has one, well, it has one panel that's probably 150 amps that's completely underutilized. Right. So when you think about it from that standpoint of what it takes to operate your house at 150 amps panel that's underutilized, and we've got 14 400 amp panels fully maxed all the time in each container. It's a lot of power. It's a it's a lot of power. It is a lot of power. Yeah. yeah. It's a ton um, of power. So going in going into kind of the other things, right? We one thing that's unique about our chemistry critical, right, is we are very vertically integrated within our, our parent company. So there's, we make a lot of our own raw components, okay, from the racking that we use, we process all that from just bare metal, um, the structural steel for the container modifications, uh, you know, we fabricate 100% of that in-house and buy metal directly from the mills, right? So large, you know, large scale production on the structural steel side. We, we ended up designing and, and manufacture our own power distribution panel. So unlike, unlike a lot of uh, companies out there, we don't use your traditional PDU, right? Like rack mounted PDU with all your, your outlets on there. We couldn't find a PDU manufacturer that could scale their production quickly enough to meet our, our supply chain demand. So our engineering team went out and designed our own custom power panels where we source all of, the, all of our raw material, right? Breakers, fuses, bus bars, and basically you know, build our own custom power distribution panels. We try to take as much much of the supply chain items and bring them in house so that we control our own destiny. Okay. There's, there's a few components that obviously we have to purchase network switches, um, the fans, like I said, we, we purchase those domestically, um, you know, from 
uh, very reputable fan manufacturer. The only component that we're currently sourcing out of China are some power cords. So, and that this all kind of was a transition for our business during COVID, right? We had to continue to, to deliver product to our customers, um, obviously throughout COVID. Very hard to get components during uh, COVID out of Asia. So we increased our supply chain efforts to source as much stuff domestically as we can, just from a standpoint of not having to worry about stuff being stuck uh, off of the, the port in, in LA, which I'm sure we've all we've all felt some pain on. So, you know, from that, we, we have a very sophisticated supply chain and inventory process where really to hit the lead times that we need, we're, you know, we've got cycle counts on everything that we use and we're all, always bringing in fresh inventory for um, near-term stuff, but we, we have very strategic supply chain partners um, within our, you know, our vendor community that are helping stock certain critical components at their facilities so that we can react very quickly to new customer orders. Awesome. Appreciate that info. We're sort of going from like the beginning to the whole deployment process. So might as well keep on track. What does it look like rolling out one of these container solutions from the Denver warehouse and into the field? And how do you guys work with the team to get that done? You, you mentioned like the landing pad that needs to be constructed. I actually saw one of those being constructed at a Nebraska facility. Uh, seems pretty basic and standard. So maybe there's not a lot of details or nuance there, but I'd be curious to know about like the whole process of working with a mining operations team, getting one of these deployed, how long it takes to have that deployment done, how long it takes to have the container stabilized, hooking it up to the grid. What are some possible uh, failures that occur when this, when you deploy these and what sort of solutions have you guys found for those failures? Curious to know about the, the whole deployment process. Yeah, so kind of, kind of the whole process, right? Even from the, the beginning of the, the sales side is one prerequisite for someone to purchase a container from us is they have to come visit our facility, right? From the standpoint that we want people to get inside these containers, touch the containers, see what they're purchasing. Um, you know, we can go through, go through the whole scope, right? So that we're really trying to avoid the, issues on site of we didn't know what was provided and, and what we should have provided, right? We can bring you into our facility, go through full containers so that the, the purchaser who hopefully is bringing their operator can really see how these are set up, right? Once we, once we implemented that uh, requirement, it really helped on the coordination on the back end, right? So from there, one of the requirements that we need to know up front, obviously, is the type of machines that the client's uh, going to be running just so that we can make sure we've got the proper containment inside for, for airflow, right? Just the form factor of the micro BT is so different than uh, bitmain units. So from there, right, customer places an order. Um, once that order is up in the queue, it takes us, it takes us eight days. Okay. So it takes us eight days to build each unit, which is uh, very quick, right? And, and we can thank Henry Ford for that, right? We, we're really using the assembly line process, right? Which is very, very effective on, on a product, right? So we've got standard work, all the materials there each morning for the employees, very little waste in it with an assembly line mentality. Okay, so that module gets built in eight days, deployed out to the customer site. So We've got a very thorough engineering document um, for site startup. The first unit that a customer buys, we're going to send our, our technical team on site to be there with the customer during startup. Okay, This goes back to, to two megawatts. We want to make sure that the customer is doing pre-energization startups. Um, depending on the location, these containers may travel you know, a thousand miles across country to their site. We always want to err on the, the side of caution and safety uh, with dealing with this much power. So we're going to pull, you know, power panel covers off, check our torque marks, make sure nothing rattled loose uh, during shipment. And it's very important that we do that on the first unit to train the, their on-site team how to receive and inspect new containers coming online. We've 
we've seen a lot of customers get away from doing concrete pads for these units and just putting in helical piers or, or some type of um, case on type pier, really from the standpoint that at scale, you can save you know large volumes of concrete by, by doing these, right? So we have very detailed engineered drawings saying, hey, when you receive our unit, you need to have you know footings placed at these locations um, to support the unit, right? And speed up this on-site time. The other, the other thing is, you know, based off of two megawatts on how much airflow we have coming into this container, we do have large external intake hoods. So we want to train the on-site team on how to uh, efficiently um, and properly install these intake hoods just so that, you know, it minimizes anything, any issues uh, once they start the container for their airflow. There's, there's been um, one item of coordination, right, that we haven't figured out now, but in the beginning, right, something we learned very early on was, you know, is the customer bringing in underground feeders from their transformer or are they going to run, you know, some type of busing system above ground, right? So these are all things that we've kind of vetted out through our process of, you know, in our checklist to go through with new clients to understand how they're going to set up their site. So that when they receive our container, it, it truly is plug and play. Um, you kind of asked about issues, right? Every every company is going to have issues at some point uh, in the manufacturing process. Sure, we we have to, but it's, it's all about how you respond. Um, and I think if you ask our customers, we're, we're very responsive. If there is a warranty or, or quality issue, right? Um, the... The issues typically come down more of if we're having to integrate a new component from a supply chain standpoint, uh, that something we, we overlooked or, or didn't catch uh, during the build. So we've, you know, we're very responsive in that standpoint to get customers going. One thing I can think of, right, is some of the fuses uh, we had at one point where all the fuses happened to be rattling loose uh, during transportation, right? So uh, identify that with a new product. Uh, goes all the way through a QA, QC process of a root cause analysis up to engineering. They very quickly have to create a, a solution, how to, you know, fix what the client received, plus everything on our shop floor. So it's a, it, it's a very collaborative effort with, you know, our Lean Six Sigma 5S kind of processes to capture any QC issues, uh, rectify them with the customer, corrective action report, uh, close the item out to make sure it doesn't happen again. For energization, I'm wondering about that process specifically. That's something at our compass when we're doing deployments, we always try to give a wider estimate for energization because there's a lot of things going into hooking up a local power grid and then bringing on all these containers that demand so much energy, right? Two megawatts is nothing to sniff at. So yep. I'd be curious to get your knowledge about that as well. Yeah, so I mean, we're... And this is kind of one beauty of, of containers, right, is typically what we see is, you know, these customers have large sites, say, let's say 100 megawatt site. They're not lighting 100 megawatts up on day one, right? It's it's the beauty of, of doing containers that we can get their their mining infrastructure online and these kind of more bite-sized and manageable chunks in, in two megawatts. So I'd say a typical customer is going to, you know, on a volume project, they want to receive somewhere between... 10 to 10 to 20 containers a month. Okay. So, you know, 20 to 40 megawatts. And we're seeing, depending on how they're set up with and staffed on site, that they're successfully able to, you know, light up, you know, five to six containers a week, um, which, which is a lot, right? There's a lot of infrastructure behind the scenes that has to be done before our containers arrive. And just from the, the pure, volume of miners that is of unboxing yeah uh, loading it's like 2500 it, miners you know that's a lot yeah it's a lot of it's a lot of trash to even like clean up right like all these boxes it, it, it's a lot so it just it just depends on how ready the customer is on the, on their site sometimes we get there and they've got an army of 10 people saying hey let's get going uh, sometimes we get there and they say oh man we didn't realize there's going to be this uh <laughs> this much infrastructure work to do that makes sense. Going right along, I'm curious knowing 
about the partners you guys work with the most or large orders that you guys have um, deployed already in the field? Yeah, great question. So, you know, this year, this year alone, uh, up to date or what in July, we've we've deployed right around 800 megawatts um, just from January to, to right now. So, you know, we're we're dealing we're partnering and working with the large guys in the space, Compute North. Um, you know, they've got some very large sites, U.S. Bitcoin Corp. Um, they've got some some nice sites. Um, that they just finished and coming online very soon, and and you know Compass right where uh, you know we, we deployed ten megawatts to you guys uh, last month, so you know we're we're definitely working with our our core business group is definitely the larger kind of uh, infrastructure uh, industrial size miners, uh, but that's not to say we don't we don't sell one off containers to to smaller people right there's um, you know, space station mining, right? They're a great group of guys, very smart. They've got a, a, a great market strategy and, um, you know, we're working with them on much smaller deployments, but it doesn't really matter for us, right? We've got a product that rolls off of our, uh, our production line. So whether someone wants one container or, you know, 300 containers, uh, I love working with kind of all different sizes in the market. Totally. And while we're staying on the topic of, who you guys have partnered with in the past and, and stuff like that. I'd be curious to know what is your guys' sort of outlook for the next six months to 12 months and feel free to get as general or specific as you can with that. Sure. Uh, but I'd be curious to know, just given Bitcoin's prices down, things are slowing. We can look at network hash rate, difficulty of Bitcoin mining. It's definitely slowed down around 215 exahash for the total network. People were predicting 300 exahash by the end of the year. I think we could get close to that if we see a lot of these deployments go online, but mm -hmm. I, I've heard of a lot of firms start slowing down production and it makes sense, right? You're earning less Bitcoin per day. So there's going to be a, a slowdown in terms of deploying new units. Yeah. It's funny. We've, we've, we've seen some customers slow down. Um, that's just a fact. At the same time though, we have some customers who are like doubling down right now. They're, they're seeing the price of machines um, so you know, enticing right now that they're that they're pushing to, to place orders with, to get new machines to get stuff built while they can put you know if they're well capitalized right if they feel like they can put their capital to work right now to go further than maybe where that cap is going to go you know eight months from now to, you know hopefully when the price of Bitcoin goes back up. I think one one other big thing, right, is we're just we're seeing a little bit of a slowdown in Texas uh, as far as people actually being able to execute on their their power deals to get sites up and running. There's there's a lot of machines uh, that are in boxes right now that people want to get deployed that they don't have the sites and power deals done. So that's I'd say that's probably almost more of a a hurdle that we're seeing with some of our customers is, is getting power versus the price of Bitcoin, right? That the, I'm sure like Compass and the big guys we're dealing with, they're, they're so long-term on Bitcoin. Yeah. Grant, everyone's going to tighten up the, the purse strings a little bit right now, but we don't see people, you know, completely cutting off the, the funnels. We just, we're seeing a slowdown, re-strategize, um, but definitely the companies that have working capital right now, I think are going to rise to the top very quickly. Yeah, that makes sense. And it's similar to some other conversations I've had with Bitcoin miners out there and just operators in the space. Texas had a lot of mining go to it. A lot of people were getting these uh, energy deals ready. They didn't get them quite across the finish line or ERCOT pumped the brakes on the whole situation. And now they're sort of just sitting, waiting. They might even have some of the infrastructure done, but they're going to have to hold tight. Uh, hopefully they, they're able to do that. But it's not super shocking when you look at how many gigawatts, literally gigawatts of power people were trying to push into Texas at the same time. And then even just this week, right, we had curtailment in Texas. All these miners had to shut down at the same time. Uh, it's awesome they can do that. But at the same time, I would say from ERCOT's perspective, it might be time just to calm down in deploying Bitcoin miners. Um, that a lot of people might not like that, but I think it's probably the appropriate thing to do. 
Um, moving on, as we kind of close the conversation here, I'm curious about next products you guys are working on. Since you guys are in the forefront of engineering for Bitcoin mining, I know there's a few things up your guys' sleeve. One with an immersion build out with a, a joint venture with another firm. And then there's one other one that you wanted to talk about on the podcast today as well. Yeah. So let, let's, uh, let's, let's stick on air cool first and then we'll jump to jump to immersion. So, uh, we, you know, depending on when this comes out, we're launching a Texas edition mining container. Okay. So we, we've, we've spent the last, you know, couple months during these hot times in Texas working hand in hand with, you know, our big operators down there for understanding some of the issues that they're facing in West Texas from heat, dust, <laughs> uh, crazy wind storms. Okay. So there's some, there's some things down there that are uniquely, uh, different to, you know, I'm going to say the Texas environment. So we've, we've, we have a team of engineers working on this with the operators coming up with, you know, a handful of what I'm going to say enhancements to our core product, uh, to really battle the, the Texas environment. Um, so we're getting ready to launch that product uh, when it's, it'll be available starting in September. Uh, we're taking orders on it now and deployments will start happening in September. And, and really it's, it's an engineering problem. Okay? It's, you know, it's just like, it's just like any kind of uh, large deployment of, of, of infrastructure. Temperatures, wind, it's all manageable. It's just an engineering problem, right? So we've we've come up with some very unique solutions on how to on how to have a solution that the miners can ride through these these high temps, you know, 105, uh, 110 degrees, um, without having to drop down to you know 70, 80 percent of their hash rate. So look look for that product coming out here. Um, very soon. Okay, switching gears. So yeah, you also asked about kind of our six to eight month outlook. We do see a, a huge trend of customers wanting to to go towards immersion, um, and you know, there's a handful a handful of reasons. We we feel like there's always going to be a market for air cooled containers in certain geographic locations, and air cooled works perfect. Um, but as we transition in part of our production into immersion, we've we have partnered with Skate Ventures, who um, a lot of longtime miners know that name. Very early into the space, uh, specifically around immersion. Okay, so they they've been uh, doing immersion for about four years right now, right? So it's a uh, you know one of the first people in the space doing that. They we're basically scaling their technology. Okay. So what I tell people is that, you know, with our solution, you're getting the manufacturer manufacturing prowess of RK mission critical and the engineering combined with real world, real world data and operator experience in immersion over the past four years. Okay. So the, the big differentiator between uh, our product and other things on the market is that we're not using a traditional, bathtub approach that you know 99% of all other immersion uh, products are utilizing we feel like there's inherent um, issues with that kind of design of having hot spots in the tank um, you can't mix and match miners and, and tanks very easy and as as new tech new form factors come online those tanks kind of become obsolete right because they're so custom designed for a certain uh, a certain type of miner where what we're doing is, you know, we're, we have individual tubs for each individual miner with individual flow control to each individual miner. So we're less worried about fluid temp and we care about the chip temp, right? So we can individually control the chip temperature of every miner on our system versus kind of looking at a, a tub as a complete aggregate, right? So and it's it's still modular. We're still sticking at this this two megawatt density. Um, and talking about supply chain, right? There's there's different components in an immersion system than air system. Um, 
so we've we've partnered with some large OEM companies to custom design and manufacture specific immersion uh, components. PDUs, for example, right? We are going to use PDUs uh, versus our custom power panels uh, in our immersion system from the standpoint that we didn't feel like there was truly a, a PDU on the market that that meets code. Once you start overclocking to this, you know, 6,500 watts, 7,000 watts that we're able to do in our system. So from that mindset, right, we've, we've custom designed, engineered, partnered with some companies to basically bring multiple new products to the space that are all going to be kind of encompassed underneath our entire uh, offering. Yeah, th- there's a whole other conversation we could have about like staying up to code on a lot of these mining operations. Um, I know Neil Galloway, I'll give him a little shout out on our mining operations team is always talking about that, how there's a lot of providers out there or legacy products that are not up to code. And nowadays, since Bitcoin mining is such in the, uh, it's in headlines, it's in the regulatory scope, you're going to see more uh, regulators coming out and asking about that coding. Uh, Jesse, I want to thank you so much for joining us on the Compass podcast today. Again, we'll have to do this in person soon again, but this was a lot of information. I think people are really going to enjoy this podcast because there's nothing quite like it out there. So again, thank you for your time. Yeah, appreciate it. Uh, Good chat. Yeah.